interesting mechanism and uh, or also called offsetting uh, mechanism in here. It's not a permit uh, to um, emit one ton of, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but one carbon credits or carbon offset or voluntary or verified Olivier. carbon units, several names for the same thing. Olivier. Yes. You, you're not presenting anymore. I think you will okay. need to present. I think uh, I think Moses, you'll have to give that um, and back to me. I think. Let me. Yeah, I can't. I'm no longer the host. Uh, sorry. So it's uh, for uh, on my end. It's showing that you're still the host. So. I think someone is, someone is, okay, I can do it now. I think that will, that should work. You can do it, okay. Okay, sorry about this. Can you see the screen now? The presentation? Yeah, we can, yes. Yes, okay. we can. All right, thank you, I'll resume. So I was saying that on one hand, we have the emission trading system, on the other hand, we have sort of project mechanism or what we call you know often carbon projects they are issuing carbon credits or also called carbon offset or voluntary or verified carbon units all these are different terms to say the same thing this corresponds to one ton of carbon dioxide that could be all the greenhouse gas emission as well that is uh, emitted by a project or delivered to a project that reduces greenhouse gas emissions and we'll see the type of project that, that are concerned by, uh, by by this and this carbon credits is often is always you know uh, delivered by let's say an authority which often is an independent non-for-profit organizations and so to name a few of them for the you know, the, the best known uh, this includes uh, the verified carbon standard this includes the gold standard um, but also under the Kyoto protocol the UNF Triple C, so the United Nations Framework Commission on Climate Change, also has been sort of delivering those uh, carbon uh, credits. Those carbon credits are um, sometimes uh, traded between companies that have uh, compliance requirements towards the authorities, but also can be traded by companies on a purely voluntary uh, basis. There's always a project behind, uh, you know, a carbon credit or carbon offsets. Um, by the contrary, carbon allowances and permits are purely sort of fictional, almost, um, you know, um, units materialized by an authority uh, to um, industrial companies at the time. Um, jumping to the next slide. Um, here's another illustration of how you as a project obtain or can obtain carbon credits. It's called a baseline and credit mechanism because a baseline is established um, against which the performance can be measured and um, form a pathway now and in the future. There's someone writing on the screen, I think. <laughs> That's a bit disturbing. Uh, this, um, so basically, the, the the blue line is what would take what would happen in the absence of the projects. So, for instance, if you had a you know land, uh, and then you were leaving that land uh, as as such, then you might sort of uh, see an emission emission of greenhouse gas, uh, you know, to the level featured in as the, as the blue line. Um, the uh, green line is what happened in terms of greenhouse gas emissions when you implement project activities. And, um, and, 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 the, and the green and sort of the yellow, the yellow sort of sections is basically emission reductions enabled through uh, the um, implementation of, of activities. And so the yellow part corresponds to uh, the emission reduction that the project may be able to materialize as carbon credits and to sell onto the carbon market to finance part of all of the activities um, implemented. Just gonna. Um, the, um, um, so the compliance market initially, the carbon market and carbon mechanism was initially established under the Kyoto uh, Protocol and uh, you know, it involves companies and government by the, 
bound by the law to account for the greenhouse gas emissions and to uh, surrender matching allowances and permits, as I've explained, as part of the carbon trade system. And now the carbon market rules at the international level are being defined by the Paris Agreement, which was adopted in 2015. And subsequently, some of the uh, rule book of the Paris Agreements uh, established or uh, adopted last year under uh, the Glasgow um, Pact. In parallel, we've seen emerging a voluntary carbon market, which um, um, which um, is um, uh, which is using similar kind of financing mechanisms to the compliance carbon market. Simply, this is a market where uh, companies are um, interacting on a voluntary um, basis. Um, and so um, here, for instance, you know, giving some examples of compliance and voluntary carbon markets, compliance market uh, under cap and trade, we had, for example, a number of, of, of units generated by, by country in New Zealand, in, in European Union. And on the, on the other side, we, we have, you know, some um, carbon market schemes like the Japanese one that um, enables companies to exchange um, carbon allowances and permits, but on a purely voluntary basis. And then on the other side, we have a range of baseline and credit mechanism. Uh, those defined under the Kyoto Protocol, like the clean development mechanism and the joint implementation, and those that are uh, totally independent from any kind of authority. And this is the one that we'll be referring to uh, today. So those are notably a mechanism that uh, issue credits uh, such as the gold standard or Vera or Plan uh, Viva. Um, the two um, markets have got very different drivers. You know, on the compliance carbon markets, uh, we are seeing uh, entities buying carbon credits being very much driven by the cost of the emission reduction of the carbon uh, units. Some of them would pay attention to maybe the project location, but again, most importantly, the cost will be the main drivers of, you know, for supporting a project. And on the voluntary carbon market, which is of interest to us today, uh, we see a range of reasons that explain uh, why company or how companies sort of uh, select projects to uh, to support. So a lot of them are. Uh, looking for projects that deliver core benefits, as in sort of social, economic, other environmental benefits. Um, organizations who are buying carbon credits and supporting projects on a purely voluntary basis, they want to find some kind of uh, fit between their organization and the project on the ground. Um, it could be the technology, it could be the stakeholders involved. Uh, we also seeing um, organizations buying carbon credits on the voluntary carbon markets looking at project location as one of the criteria that is considered uh, for instance it could be a coca-cola buying carbon credits from project located where um, you know it's sourcing uh, raw products um, and obviously cost is always going to be uh, you know a, a factor that is taken into consideration for you know when companies buy carbon uh, credits. So on the voluntary carbon market, just to make sure everyone is on board with that ID, we are seeing companies that have no obligation whatsoever uh, to comply with any sort of law, to do anything about their greenhouse gas emissions, but that are often, that have often established plans to reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we see that there being, you know, this sort of company being very active in Europe, in, in the US and in, in Australia and other part of the world as well. Um, and then, you know, beyond their own emission reductions, they are supporting projects beyond their value chain, beyond their operations. So, sorry, uh, sorry, Olivia. Yeah. Moses? Sorry, Olivia, for the... Um... Uh, could you kindly admit uh, the people? It's like there are a lot of people in the waiting room, so that maybe you can just uh, admit them. Thank you. Okay, I'll try that. How do you do that? Um, sorry. Um, okay, I think. Yeah. 
it is quite a lot of people indeed. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to admit them, I think, one by one. I think everyone is in now, hopefully. Not three. Okay, I think that works now. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, let me just, uh, can you still see my screen? No, no. Uh, Moses, can you still see my screen? Uh, Oliver, I can't see the screen. Okay, so you can. Okay. No, we cannot see the screen. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so the voluntary carbon markets, um, again, is a, a market driven by corporates and individuals, uh, mostly for social responsibilities uh, considerations. The voluntary carbon markets are not, at least today, directly related to uh, countries and sovereign uh, emissions or emission reduction objective, although it will increasingly be under the, the Paris Agreement, and that's one of the things that we'll be discussing. Um, the, the voluntary carbon market can be seen as a complementary tool to things like carbon taxes, which we have in, uh, for instance, in South Africa, or um, emission trading schemes. Uh, like you know, of those we have in in the uh, in the EU or in California or um, in other uh, jurisdictions, um, but it's also because it's not sort of uh, uh, you know driven by authorities, and uh, you know it's it's the source. It's it's increasingly sophisticated. It's a source of innovation, and um, and, and and inspirations for uh, for many project developers. Those carbon certification standards, which are delivering oh, carbon credits, are um, enabling projects of all sorts, of all size and all kind of jurisdictions to uh, be able to sell carbon assets whenever they're able to demonstrate that they are delivering emission reduction. Sorry, could could sorry olivia could you just uh mute our microphones because we're getting some uh, feedback in the background i think there's someone who has got their mic on thank you yeah thank you i think there's still someone here i think emmanuel chungu it's not muted um so you know there's, there's several reasons why companies buy carbon credits um, most of them would do it for reputational or brand image uh, purposes some of them might do it for employee engagements giving um just try to mute the person who are not able to mute themselves okay i think that works now um yeah, and and uh, and some some companies using the carbon markets are use, are doing it for trying to differentiate themselves from um, their um, competitors. Um, those are pictures of who's been buying carbon credits on on the markets uh, on the voluntary carbon market. This has mostly been sort of multinational company, multinational and domestic companies uh, from the private uh, sector. We have seen some public sector and governments engaging with the voluntary carbon markets, but you can see compared to, to the, the involvement of the private sector, the share of the public sector is fairly, um, is fairly small. And so it's kind of a very dynamic market because it's mostly driven by the private, um, by the private sector. Um, this, um, on this market, we have different prices for different carbon assets. Or different different carbon uh, credits. So depending on the sector you implement your uh, project within, uh, you may be able to get a different price on on the carbon markets. Here are five type of uh, project or sectors that could benefit from uh, selling carbon credits if they're able to implement project and activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have the forestry and the land use sector, and I will go a bit more in detail into the nature of the activities that would qualify 
for uh, you know issuing carbon credits. The largest, uh, usually the the, the, the highest uh, price points that uh, we've seen on the market is um, you know project related to agriculture, uh, soil carbon capture, uh, conservation agriculture. They are often quite expensive to to implement, and so on a cost based uh, on a cost basis, those are you know projects that may that may be more more. Uh, capital intensive and that would uh, come in the higher price on the carbon market. We're seeing forestry and land use change related uh, project to be quite popular on the market, either uh, nature restorations or forest conservations because they bring a lot of um, benefits beyond uh, carbon around soil, around biodiversity, around water. Uh, we're also seeing household and community devices being quite popular in the market. So this corresponds here to a project implementing or um, promoting improved cooking technologies. Um, but it could also be at the industrial uh, scale for improved, for example, charcoal making or uh, improve, uh, improve sort of brick making. And, and the reduction of the use of, you know, the reduction of energy consumption in these processes. And then um, some products are slightly less popular or they're of larger size and they come in and, and with the trigger a lower price on the market. Also the market price sort of is changing every day now. Uh, so, you know, improved waste uh, management could trigger emission reductions. Uh, the production of renewable electricity, such as, you know, through solar, hydro, wind can, uh, be eligible to generate carbon credits and we are seeing in some and some manufacturing processes improving um, energy efficiency for instance would potentially uh, benefits or can you know uh, from from carbon credits the prices are indicative here uh, they are indexes on the market now to follow prices on a daily basis and so prices have been uh, changing um, all the time and for instance, we're seeing the forestry and land use project are currently triggering prices of between eight and sixteen dollars. Um, and renewable energy probably around sort of you know six to you know four four to eight dollars maybe, and similar to to for household devices around sort of eight to ten dollars. One of the reasons the market uh, or everyone has, has uh, recently been possibly hearing about the carbon markets, although it's been around for uh, 15 uh, years, is because of the push that we are seeing from companies um, in mostly uh, the West and Europe and, and the US who have been um, committing to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in line with, or to reach net zero emission by, by 2030, 2040, or 2050. What it does is that it's, uh, those companies are basically committing to not only reducing their own greenhouse gas emissions in line with science, which uh, means basically, uh, you know, emission reduction on the order of 5% every year, which is uh, a dramatic uh, decrease of greenhouse gas emissions, but they're also committing to balancing out all the emissions that they have not, they would not have been able to reduce um, themselves. And that's where the voluntary carbon offset come, uh, come in. Um, these uh, emissions that won't be abated, they are expected to be balanced out through the purchase of voluntary carbon credits or um, through from projects uh, in developing countries, but not exclusively. Um, from project reducing greenhouse gas emissions, most importantly, one of the one of the type of project that has been sort of flagged as as you know holding a, a significant potential is what is uh, now known as natural climate solution or nature based solutions. Those are activities um, implemented. Um, uh, well, th th those are activities that enables basically to capture greenhouse gas emission through natural ecosystems or activities that uh, avoid further emissions to be emitted. Um, so this include, for instance, reforestation. This would, this would include any activities that would have a positive impact, impact on the forest cover. Uh, this could also include uh, soil capture 
uh, of carbon through improved, uh, you know, agricultural uh, practices. Um, and this includes as well for countries that have, uh, you know, a lively coastal ecosystems, protection of mangrove uh, uh, um, ecosystems, uh, for, uh, for instance. So we're seeing a rise in, in, in awareness around, around climate change. We've seen that sort of coming since the Paris Agreement in 2015 and even more so since 2019 and 2020, where companies have started to try to um, put in place plans to align their own operations with and ambitions with with the Paris Agreements, which uh, which is very ambitious in terms of, you know, greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, so um, a lot of this project, or most of this project, especially when they relate to natural ecosystems, they would um, trigger other benefits, you know, other than greenhouse gas emissions, because in most contexts in most countries there is there's not necessarily a very uh, strong need or appeal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that like it may be the case in, in Zambia, but a lot of those projects funded through the sale of carbon credits, they would also often trigger, um, you know, social, economic, biodiversity benefits that are important in any, in any context. So here are some of those schemes uh, that are certifying emission reduction projects and that track uh, you know, non-carbon uh, benefits. For example, the gold standard, that is one of the, the, you know, the well-known certification standard that issue carbon credits. They also requires project developers to include how the project activities uh, will impact sustainable development uh, in the local area where it's implemented as part of the certification process. Uh, VERA, the organization, US-based organization, VERA, it's called the certification standard called SD Vista. Which uh, there's still someone who's not on mute, I think, which is a bit annoying. Um, Esther Mulonga. Okay, I think I'll just do it myself. Um, um, so SD Vista is one 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 of the certain you know standards that sort of certified co-benefits, uh, and then for forestry related product and land use product, we have this certification standard called Climate Community and Biodiversity that sort of uh, is applicable to all land use projects and that quantify project benefits on climate, community, and biodiversity. And when a project is certified to uh, a certification standard and co-benefits standard like this one it often triggers a higher price on, on, on the market. We've recently seen a price difference of $5 per carbon uh, credits between uh, credits that have uh, been certified to uh, by you know, CCB in addition to a regular certification standards such as the VCS, the Verified Carbon Standards. Um, this can, uh, in a sense, also, you know, beyond sort of contributing to climate change goals, uh, this sort of investments by uh, corporates can also uh, support, you know, biodiversity financing gap. Um, and um, yeah, and I've already mentioned that the premiums that, that project developers can get out of certifying their project with a co-certification, co-benefit standard. Um, just mindful of time, which probably going to, accelerate a bit. So here, this is the case of, of Zambia. We carried out some uh, landscape analysis uh, last year of uh, what uh, you know, Zambia looked like when it comes to carbon project and, and, and carbon finance. And we have uh, seen that the most used carbon certification standard in Zambia is the verified carbon uh, standards followed by the clean development mechanism. The clean development mechanism is the, is the mechanism defined under the Kyoto Protocol and the verified carbon standard is today the largest uh, voluntary uh, certification standards. Uh, most of the roles of, the, of the, very, the VCS are borrowed from the CDM. So they are very similar carbon certification mechanism. And until last year, there was no project in Zambia that had either been registered or uh, instead of um, rather issued credits by any other standard, including the gold standard. Um, in terms of the nature of the project that have benefited from um, you know, carbon finance in Zambia, we, find, we found a, a project in the agricultural and forestry sectors are uh, the projects um, that have benefited the most from, from carbon finance. And this include a range of 
project that you may be aware of uh, that I have been working on conserving uh, existing forests from uh, threats of deforestation and degradation related to agricultural encroachments, related to poaching, related to uh, biomass extraction for charcoal making or simply for uh, domestic uh, use for uh, cooking. We are seeing that also, we've seen also the improved cooking sorry, devices. Sorry, promotion. Olivia. Yeah. Um, we could just try to admit some of the yeah. people. All right. Thank you. But E7C is the issue by changing the chiku. E7 lead. Let me just try to do that. Okay. There's still one person whose phone is uh, is uh, is, is unmuted and they're making a lot of noise. Are you able to locate them from your end so that you could uh, just mute them? Esther, Esther. Charanda. Yeah, I'm just trying to admit everyone now. Okay, and then I need to monitor. Um, okay, I don't see the person who's not muted here. Uh, Olivia, it's, uh, it's Esther, Esther Mwemba. There's quite a lot of people. I think it's difficult to manage everyone's, uh, you know. So if you could just all mute yourself, I am not, I don't seem to be able to do it now for some reason. Yeah. Esther, can you please mute yourself or drop off? Okay, thank you, Moses. Um, so resuming here, um, you know, there there has been a relatively limited access to carbon finance in uh, in, in Zambia, although uh, uh, you know. Uh, with 16 projects that are currently uh, certified and low to generate carbon credits, although uh, some countries in the regions are low, uh, worth off. And, uh, but compared to maybe other, other regions or, or South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, and uh, we have seen carbon credits in Zambia being traded between three and uh, $12. Uh, um, just going to, Try to move to the next uh, here. This is uh, this gives an idea of, of the carbon credits that were um, issued over the past years by all carbon certification standard, which here um, includes the CDM, the Clean Level Mechanism, and the Verified Carbon Standard. And you see there is a progressive increase in takeoff uh, volumes being um, generated by projects and uh, project level benefiting from. You know uh, here you see. Um, you know, 1.8 million credits, you know, more than 1.8 million credits delivered in 2017, you multiply that by, you know, a uh, uh, price of five to to, uh, to $12, and you have an idea of, of how much uh, um, fund is, is, you know, flown to this sort of uh, uh, project um, over the past years. Here's a um, uh, sort of case study of, of, of a project that is uh, that was started in 2012 and covers five districts in, in Zambia and notably in the eastern uh, province, and that generates about 20,000 ton of carbon dioxide annually, which you know it reduces you know uh, this amount of greenhouse gas emissions, which means that it, it delivers and sells or has the ability to, to sell every year. That's um, many carbon credits. The, the, the aim of the project and the program is to uh, sustainably increase smallholder farmer crop uh, yields, income, and welfare, and to reduce uncontrolled forest loss and uh, degradations, as well as increase the net forest cover. In a sense, all this enables uh, more carbon to be stored in land and, and trees and less carbon to be released back into the atmosphere due to 
um, encroachments over uh, forest um, lands. Uh, there are two components to these projects. Uh, the first one is the sustainable land management, which, which includes a range of uh, agricultural uh, you know, uh, practices over uh, more than 7,000 hectares. And then um, there's a much larger area dedicated to um, conserving existing forests and, and uh, preserving that forest from uh, current, um, currently active agents of uh, drivers of deforestation and degradation like those I have mentioned before, charcoal making, agricultural expansion, um, a domestic, um, a domestic need for, uh, for cooking. This uh, project is uh, certified by the verified carbon standard that kind of specialize into forest conservation um, projects and uses two carbon quantification and monitoring methodologies. And I'll explain the process to get a project certified um, and how this sort of, you know, quantification methodology fits in. Uh, and this uh, organization is, uh, is, is, is Comaco, and it, and it sort of links uh, about under, more than 100,000 small urban farmers um, and, and create market incentive and value chain to achieve uh, poverty reduction. So those are, this is a sort of project that could be uh, possibly implemented over uh, the entire uh, country is notably where uh, you know, uh, agricultural and forest land start sort of conflicting. As another project that has been out there for for a while, uh, you know, we distributed fifteen thousand uh, improved cooking stove to replace the three stones that you see on on the on the pictures and that you're probably or possibly familiar with. This uh, sort of such project reduces um, about forty thousand ton of carbon dioxide a year, which means that it can sell forty thousand carbon credits every year to corporates who are uh, willing to balance out their uh, their their emissions um, this is a project that is implemented in rural areas so it's mostly focusing uh sort of displacing three stone fires uh, and the use of the intense use of um, firewood that is most commonly uh, used for cooking in rural area but it could you know we could have a similar project in in, in urban areas you know focusing on a charcoal um, consumption. The project stoves uh, enable the reduction of biomass consumption, so you know firewood consumption by 66%, and that's what enables the you know emission reduction. So more more carbon remains stored in trees. Um, the the way the carbon finance uh, is used here is that the, the the improved technology is distributed for free, and it's paid over time over a period of like depending on project, but you know two to five years. The, the organizations who pay for the improved cooking stove, they receive the carbon credits to sell the carbon credits and they use this funding to repay their uh, purchase of uh, you know, improved technology. And there are several ways that carbon finance can be used, but that's, that's one of them here. So that enables the you know, household who would not be able to afford uh, an improved cooking technology to, to have one. And exchange of that technology, they transfer their emission reduction rights to the organization financing the, the, the project or the activity. So the project helps curb deforestation, as you can easily imagine. Uh, it leads, but also has a plenty of other sort of non-carbon related benefits, such as time saving for, for users uh, and health impacts with less sort of indoor um, you know, air pollution, smoke and pollutants. Um, mindful of the time, I'm just going to try to, you know, speed up a bit the pace here. Um, so this is important to look at the carbon market in the context of uh, Zambians' com international commitments and strategy, and uh, Zambia's commitments to the Paris Agreements and to the international community is formulated into its its nationally determined contribution, which was uh, first published in 2015 for the Paris. Uh, uh, agreements and that has recently been revised uh, in 2021 in its commitment. Uh, the government of Zambia has committed to uh, reducing 20 to 38 million tons of carbon dioxide by 2030 compared to a baseline as usual scenario, a scenario where the country will keep growing its economy. Um, and um, some of these emissions notably the 38 is conditional to Zambia being able to tap into 
international climate finance mechanism. And carbon finance and the carbon market and carbon project is one of these um, mechanisms. The sector covered by this, uh, well, this commitment and, um, and, and all these sectors are eligible to be used to be potentially uh, generating carbon credits include sustainable forest management, sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, energy efficiency, transport, um, liquid, liquid waste such as wastewater treatment um, and uh, you know, coal production, sorry, transportation sorry, and consumption. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. Uh, there are a number of people who would like to be admitted. Maybe if you could just uh, do that. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to do that now. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, okay, I think that should be good. Okay. Um, so I'm not getting into details into you know what all these includes, but those are sectors that you will be familiar with, active in. Uh, they're all in 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 the roadmap of Zambia to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And as you can see on the right uh, right hand side, sort of a, a diagram, uh, those are the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this were in 2019. Then. So those are also the sectors. So this could be considered the sectors where there's the biggest potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So implement activities that would benefit from carbon uh, finance and, and the sale of carbon credits. A lot of things to do in the land use change in the forestry sector, a lot of things to do in the agricultural uh, sector, a lot less in, in the other uh, sectors like waste and, and electricity and heat. Um, but uh, energy, I guess, is, is to some extent uh, captured under the first uh, the first uh, buckets and land use change in forestry since most of the energy consumed by um, household but also by the industry is actually uh, you know firewood or wood um, and you know Zambia has identified that uh, the, the not not responding to climate change uh, you know has has the potential to you know um, lower the you know, economic uh, growth of the country because of, you know, extreme uh, climate events or just regular climate events like the, the delay of the rainy season, I think that has already been felt across Sub-Saharan Africa and its impact on, on agricultural production. Um, um, it's important to keep in mind when thinking about carbon projects and activities that could be funded through carbon finance to keep in mind uh, various uh, document and strategy of the country uh, that, um, you know, that sort of articulate a vision and, um, and, and sort of um, spell out sectors uh, and, and, and issues that could be tackled uh, through activities benefiting from, from carbon finance. So the vision, vision of Zambia for 2030 is prosperous middle income country by 2030. Uh, it underpins a number of principles, including gender responsive, sustainable development, democracy, respect for human rights, uh, you know, family values, um, peaceful coexistence, private public partnership, and all these, or at least some of this could sort of be included into or integrated into the design of uh, project benefiting from, from carbon finance and uh, such initiatives that will be able to do so will more likely benefit from the support from the uh, authorities, uh, although today on the voluntary carbon markets, uh, everyone is or anyone is pretty pretty much free to sort of implement uh, activities uh, that reduce greenhouse gas emissions without authorizations apart from the forestry sector, which I'll mention later. There are also a number of uh, strategic development areas uh, that are articulated in the national development plans that are uh, useful to keep in mind, like economic transformation, uh, human and social development, environmental sustainability, good governance, uh, and a good governance environment. So at least two or three of those uh, areas could be supported by uh, projects uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and uh, um, promoting sustainability. And obviously, uh, Zambia has a strategy for climate change response, which was articulated in 2010. 
and which is more geared towards uh, supporting the countries to face the potential change triggered uh, by a changing uh, by a changing climate across all the sectors of the um, of the economy. And here, uh, although carbon finance is a tool that is mostly focusing at greenhouse gas mitigation, it can also contribute to climate change adaptation. Um, there is um, an, another sort of a part of the legislation that is um, extremely important in the context of using carbon finance in, in Zambia, and notably on projects that are uh, fighting um, uh, deforestation and forest degradation. This is one of them is the Forest Act in 2015, because it gives local communities the right to control and access to control access and use of their surrounding uh, forest, and with the authorization uh, granted by the chief of the area and the director of uh, forestry jointly, which means anyone who uh, would be willing to implement a project in the land, uh, you know, uh, controlled by, by, by community, we need to have sort of a, a joint sort of uh, authorizations from these two level of, of authorities to implement activities and benefit from carbon uh, finance. Community for us here is, is defined as a controlled, as a forest controlled use and manage under an agreement between a community forest management groups that need to be formed specifically and the forest departments. Those are requirements to implement project in Zambia in the forestry sectors, notably when they are funded through carbon finance and the agreement uh, covers uh, the agreements um, between the community forest management group and the forest department uh, covers the rights to invest in trade and forest products, including collection of medicinal herbs, honey, grass, grazing of animals. Um, but, uh, you know, later this, you know, carbon can can be considered as one of these commodity that, uh, you know, uh, come from or can you know is produced, I guess, by by uh, uh, forest. Um, there are seven steps that are required to set up community forest management scheme, from awareness uh, raising to implementing monitoring the forest management plan. And again, in Zambia, if you're willing to implement a project that will have a positive impact on the forest cover this needs to go through uh, this uh, process. There are a lot less rules for other type of projects, including energy access, including agriculture, including a range of other uh, uh, sectors, but that's the case for uh, all projects related to uh, forest. Um, there is a very new piece of legislation that was published in 2021 uh, called the Forest Carbon Stock Management Regulation, which is part of the 2015 Forest Act and that grants carbon stock management permits uh, through the Department of Forestry to entities willing to implement a uh, project, well, carbon project uh, per se. Acti activities that are eligible are include deforestation reduction, forest degradation reduction, so from extraction of biomass, forest uh, conservation, sustainable management of forest, enhancement of carbon stock. So those are different terms and perspective for, uh, you know, similar, uh, similar output, similar outcomes, the increasing forest cover, avoiding or addressing the, the threats and drivers of deforestation and, and forest degradation. Eligible areas are multiple. They, they, they can be national forests, local forests, private forests, national parks, community forest areas, game management areas. So pretty much all, you know, forest lands are eligible to um, request um, forest carbon stock management permits. Uh, and anyone can be, uh, you know, uh, requesting or the older of uh, such uh, such permits. Um, there's an application to file to the forest department to uh, obtain this uh, permits that include uh, providing information uh, related to the project location, key details, proof of right and consent of the communities that live on the land, uh, providing a stakeholder engagement plan to demonstrate how the project has and will be engaging with the communities that are um, on, on living on the land or having interest with, uh, with the lands, as well as how the project intends to uh, account for carbon and be certified to uh, a carbon certification mechanism. And maybe most important of all, 
uh, the owner of a carbon permit, so the you know the organization requesting carbon permits also need to be able to demonstrate how the proceed of the sale of carbon credits will be uh, shared among potential uh, beneficiaries. So that's the benefit sharing arrangement uh, mechanism, and this need to be defined at the level of the project with all the stakeholders um, involved. Uh, red plus in Zambia. So red plus is this mechanism. So red plus red stands for reducing emission from deforestation and forest uh, degradation. Uh, this um, is a mechanism. This is a carbon finance mechanism, but it, that is sort of specifically dedicated to conserving forest, uh, notably tropical um, forest. And this is a mechanism that has been, you know, pushed on the international climate change uh, negotiations and a number of countries uh, and, and maybe most of Saharan African countries have, you know, large chunks of forest remainings of uh, started sort of uh, developing a national strategy to benefit from carbon funds to conserve and restore uh, their forest. And that's the case uh, for, uh, for Zambia. Uh, that um, initiated that process in 2009 and finalized the strategy in 2015. I'm not going to run through them, but but you know, through that strategy, a number of causes of deforestation across the country were identified related to forest products, to agriculture, to energy, mining, and land use. I've mentioned a few of those drivers. It's here in the slide if you want to read. Um, you know, and, and we'll likely share the presentation afterwards. That uh, strategy is aligned with the vision uh, 2030, notably around sort of enabling the improvement of forest and land management and ensuring equitable sharing of both carbon and non-carbon benefits among uh, stakeholders, which I've mentioned. Um, Zambia has received that funding from United Nations RED programs to prepare its institutional framework to support project developers uh, to um, develop this sort of activities in, 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 in Zambia. And, um, and it's, it's very important for Zambia as, as it's, it's been identified as, as in the top 10 uh, countries uh, with the highest rate of deforestation uh, globally. And as you've seen in the diagram before, it contributes to nearly 60% this deforestation of greenhouse gas emission in, in Zambia. So any activity sort of counteracting this trend will potentially benefit uh, from carbon finance. Um, yeah, I think I'm just gonna do one, one or two more slides, uh, Moses, and then maybe we can pause here and then do the rest of that part uh, as, as part of the you know um, section section two. Here, just giving an example of one of the Red Plus projects that has been out there for a while, maybe one of the first Red Plus projects uh, in, in Zambia, started in 2009, covering about 40,000 hectares in the Rufunsa district and generating about four, 200,000 ton of carbon dioxide uh, or 200,000 um, carbon credits every year. And um, so that means basically the project reduces pretty much um, four to five ton of carbon dioxide per hectare by counteracting uh, past uh, agents of deforestation and forest degradation. This also means that if you multiply this 200,000 tons per, let's say, $10, that's a budget of, of about $2 million for that project to implement all these um, activities that would enable this um, emission reduction at the end. Um, so here the um, emissions where or deforestation was related to the unsustainable land use practices and illegal charcoal production. So that's something that we, that we, that we see across uh, Zambia where some areas are uh, more subject than others. To, to, to that trade, especially when it's not closer to larger urban centers. Um, and the, 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 the project developer uses at least part of this funds to train and support local communities in sustainable charcoal production and conservation farming practices um, and uh, interact with about 8,000 community uh, beneficiaries. Again, the project is certified to the verified carbon standard and it has this co-benefit standards uh, certification, which I've mentioned just before, uh, the clean community, the climate community and biodiversity 
um, standard. Um, actually, there's only two slides left here. Um, eligible sectors. Sorry, Olivia. Carbon. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. So once more, if you could just uh, allow the people in the waiting room so that they could just join as we finish the uh, last two slides. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, almost there. Very good. Um, okay, are we there? So here, nothing really new, just a repetition of what I've mentioned before. Those are uh, sectors that are eligible to use carbon finance, basically any activities that are that is large enough and that can demonstrate it reduces greenhouse gas emissions, can potentially be selling carbon credits. Those are the figure on the right hand side is just an illustration of some of the projects, uh, sort of more specific product type within each categories that have been uh, either receiving carbon credits or that are eligible simply to, uh, you know, uh, to be to become carbon carbon projects. And the last one here, I think, is quite uh, an important one. So this is the process. For so basically, it's not because a project reduces greenhouse gas emissions that it that it suddenly can sell carbon assets, and obviously that's maybe one of the one of the drawback of this mechanism. It's a fairly complex uh, mechanism. It's a fairly resource intensive mechanism that requires a fair amount of technical knowledge. And here's the schematic process for projects to be able to um, be recognized as carbon project and and deliver carbon credits. So. Um, usually, uh, there is a, a study that is being carried out on the potential for an activity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is not part of the certification process, but that's something that that uh, we often uh, that we often do to, to figure out whether you know an activity is is going to be will make sense for an activity or project to uh, you know um, go through the certification uh, process. Uh, the first, the first step of the process is actually documenting, uh, documenting the project. How's you know, what what is the project going to do? How it's going to be uh, addressing you know greenhouse gas emissions? How it's going to be monitoring emission reduction over time? Um, how it has consulted the local populations? How uh, you know describing the current situations and how this will evolve, as well as providing uh, an estimation of emission reductions that the activities will uh, trigger. Over um, over time, and that's often result in a document that is you know between 50 and 150 pages long, a fairly technical document that becomes the project uh, passport. Uh, this document is presented to the certification body. I've mentioned several times the verified carbon standard could be one of them, showing them that the, the project, confirming that the project is uh, suitable to be regi registered as a carbon project with the say a certification standard. After that, the documentation needs to be audited. The audit sort of uh, control and check that the the the, the project's uh, documentation is aligned with what's on the ground. If there's anything, and at least aligned with the rules of the certification standard it seeks um, um, certification to. And then once the the, the auditor has has provided a a, a an auditing report, uh, the document is submitted to the certification standard. Back to the certification standard in step five, uh, together with the with the document elaborated in step uh, in step two and the uh, certification standard, such as the verified carbon standard, then usually formulate a few comments and questions and register the project as a carbon project. From that point in time, the project is officially recognized as a carbon project and uh, able to issue carbon credits as long as it can demonstrate. It has materialized its emission reduction. So once the project has got this status, it has to monitor emission uh, reduction over time uh, according to um, the, the monitoring plan formulated in step two in the document. Uh, monitoring emission reductions and then having this emission reduction audited again. Uh, by by a third party auditing firm who will draft a report and send that report to the certification standard. The certification standard will look at that report and deliver carbon credits corresponding to emission reductions enabled by the project. And then from that point, the project developer has carbon credits that can sell on to the 
the voluntary carbon market. All right, this is the end of that section. So I hope um, this wasn't too sort of dense and I haven't forgotten to present some of the basic con con concept, but uh, yeah, hopefully um, this will, will be okay. And I'm happy to take any uh, clarification question here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Olivia, for that uh, detailed uh, presentation. So at this stage now, um, the first session has ended. So we are going to go into a question and answer segment. So I'll simply ask you to raise your hand, then you state uh, your full names as well as the organization which you are representing, then you can go ahead with your question. But uh, first, uh, maybe we can try to tackle the questions which have been uh, typed in. We'll be doing three at a time. Yvonne, Yvonne from Combs, I think, will be reading out our questions in the chat. Yvonne, are you able to do that? Hey, Moses, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can hear we me? can get okay. you. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll read a few questions from the comments. And this one is from Abraham. He's saying, apart from Komako and BCP, who else is involved in carbon projects in Zambia? Did you get that? Uh, yes, I got it. So I think maybe, Olivia, maybe you would like to take that or maybe I just uh, answer good, it directly. Yes. Yeah, so I think apart from yeah, um, um, Marco, you could start. I think I don't have this on the top of my head. I have it somewhere nearby. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, thanks. So apart from uh, Comarco and BCP, there are a number of uh, organizations I think which are currently okay. trying to uh -huh. develop or already implementing uh, carbon projects, of which I think just uh, off. I think the top of uh, my head, I could mention uh, Oil Forest Zambia Limited, which is located uh, on the Copper Belt. Then uh, apart from uh, Oil Forest, uh, there's also the Nature, the, the, the nature Conservancy, which is TNC. They're also just starting uh, to develop uh, uh, a project uh, in the northwestern part of this country. Then there's also the Zambia Integrated Forest uh, Landscape Project, which is uh, based in the eastern province, but it's being managed, uh, I think, under the Ministry of uh, uh, Green Economy and Environment. So those are the only ones, I think, which are coming off the top of my head, but there are still a number of projects which are currently uh, developing or implementing carbon projects in Zambia. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and just to complete, I guess, uh, there, I think you've mostly named those who were involved into the ag agricultural and forestry landscape, but there are also a few others that are active in the energy sector, I think, uh, like the Itezi Itezi Power Corporation. Uh, we have as well, uh, uh, I think, uh, Sequest Capital and Tasks of product, you know, private product developers that have been implementing project in, 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 in Zambia and the uh, improved cookstove sector. I think uh, CO2 Balance may have as well some, uh, some cookstove uh, projects implemented there. And so, yeah, so there, there are quite a few, quite a few parties that have either been uh, implementing and running project or that are currently planning uh, and searching for project opportunities or, or communities to, um, uh, to implement project with. So there's a fair amount of organizations, I guess, that's a landscape that is becoming a bit more sort of diverse than it used to be. All right, uh, thank you very much, Olivia. I, I hope that we've uh, answered that question adequately. Um, you can go ahead and read the second one, Yvonne. All right, this one is coming from Kama Hachunde. He's saying, I'm hearing this for the first time. Does it mean I can acquire land and decide to keep it as for forest use, uh, conservation method of farming? And let's see, sorry and use it for conservation method of farming, then I'm paid for it. If so, who in Zambia buys my actions and how much for one hectare, I think? 
Um, okay, I think let's start with this one. I think there are several elements uh, of, of answers here. The first one is, um, in theory, anyone you know with with lens uh, can potentially generate a mission reduction. The one thing that you need to be able to demonstrate is that uh, you will implement activities that have a positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So if you are buying a piece of land that is not either forested and non-forested, that is not under any kind of threats of being degraded or that is not particularly emitting a, a significant amount of emission reductions, then, you know, uh, although you'll have the rights to potentially implement activities, then, then you know, it's unlikely that you will actually be reducing enough greenhouse gas emission to uh, benefit from that mechanism. The, sec the second point I think to keep in mind is that uh, because of the process that I've just described in the, in the slide just before for a product to be certified and recognized as a carbon project that is fairly resource intensive, uh, projects and activities needs to be um, you know, uh, of a certain size to um, you know, be able to uh, benefit from, from carbon finance really. And it's, I can't really easily give, give you an idea, but, but with certain type of project, for instance, a, a product distributing improved cooking stove, I would at least need to distribute two or three to 5,000 improved you know, cooking stove to, to start thinking about the, the viability of using carbon finance. When it comes to uh, conserving, uh, forest um, cover and parcels. It depends very much on the current um, uh, aggressivity of, of, of drivers of deforestation and degradations. But then you'd likely need at least a, a, a land that is, you know, uh, you know, four to fifty thousand hectares large. So you know, that's that's not a, a many. I think you know, private projects uh, or private landowners that would able to to, to gather as as as, um, as much uh, land. Um, the second thing, or the last point, I think around who would buy the assets um, uh, today in Zambia, there are no very active buyers of carbon assets. Uh, although I'll mention later the role that Prospero is starting to play to try to bridge that uh, gap. And so you'd likely need to go through uh, potentially financial or technical intermediaries to find corporates in um, most likely Europe who would be, uh, you know, looking for a uh, supporting project in, in, in Zambia or in the sector um, in which you implement your activity. All right, thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, I think maybe apart from the many other factors which you've mentioned, I think it also has to make financial sense to you, the developer, because you have to pick, I think, uh, uh, a land which should entail that uh, you ultimately need to make investments, but make a profit ultimately at the end once uh, you've generated those carbon credits and uh, you've been purchased. Thank you. So, Yvonne, you can go ahead and uh, ask. Uh, the next question. Yeah, uh, this one is saying, let me just see if I can read the name. Mm. Okay, they're asking where they can sit, they have a plantation and where can I certify and which agency is dealing with this in Zambia? The certification of an existing plantation of, well, of trees. Um, I will, so the question says, I have a tree plantation. Where do I register for certification? Can you pass it so that that guy comes? See? Mm -hmm. You don't even go around yeah. okay. yeah. I'm just going to mute someone here. Okay. Um, so one of the things I have not mentioned yet is that uh, for a project to benefit from this mechanism, it needs to demonstrate that it would not take place without the support of this financial mechanism. So if you have planted trees in the past and you've done it for a reason that made sense, maybe financial sense at the time to do so, that it's unlikely that you'll be able to demonstrate that this tree plantation would not have taken place without the sale of carbon credits. 
So it's a, it's a concept called additionality. And it's just to ensure that when companies are buying carbon credits, they only buy carbon credits corresponding to a mission reduction that would not have taken place without their intervention, without their financial support. But now if you do have um, a, a parcel of lands that is uh, suitable for planting uh, trees, um, then you might say, want to consider registering that project to a certification standard such as the verified carbon standard. It's a voluntary carbon certification standard. There's no, at the moment, it's a voluntary carbon market, which means that there's no uh, body in, 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 in um, no entity, no authorities in Zambia governing the, uh, you know, the use of carbon fines by, by you know, uh, uh, private landowner, for instance. And so this, 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 you know, you don't, you don't necessarily need any authorization in, in Zambia. You don't necessarily have today, and maybe that's one of the drawbacks that I'll mention in the second part. You don't, you don't necessarily have an easy um, um, counterpart to interact with in the government to uh, either get support or directions on the best way to, uh, to use this financing mechanism. And so that's, um, that's one of the drawbacks, I guess, of this mechanism. It's purely, it's purely voluntary. But it will soon merge with with the the financing mechanism under the Paris Agreement, and it will somehow you know have a more sort of compliance, I guess, a flavor uh, to it, if I can uh, if I can say. But today, there's no no rule, no governing entity in in Zambia, and it's all to do with you know private interest uh, funding activities, buying uh, credits. All right, thanks, uh, Olivia. So now maybe, Rogers, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question before we get back to reading out the questions uh, that have been pasted in the text? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, good morning. How are you? Yeah, so my question is about uh, us, we are in full renewable energy, and we wanted to find out uh, what, what's, uh, what's uh, like, uh, which people direct deal for renewable energy um, that we can see in Zambia for, for this type of uh, program. Then the other thing, my other question is what what projects fall under energy efficient for carbon emission? Uh, Roger, so your, your first question is about um, how, how or is it possible to benefit from carbon finance for renewable energy in Zambia? Yes, exactly. Okay, so I'm guessing here you're referring to renewable electricity or any sort of other yeah. renewable energy? Yeah. Yes, okay. uh, basically like that, we make uh, solar energy for water and uh, uh, home consumption. So that's how I wanted to understand who, who can see. Okay, so here, for instance, if you, um, if you have activities promoting the use of solar power to displace other more, let's say, polluting or carbon-intensive uh, sources of, uh, of power, for instance, for instance uh, firewood or diesel generators, or then in that case, you may be able to make the case that promoting solar in your context uh, will enable uh, emission reduction because it will be displacing the use of non-sustainable non firewood or because it will be displacing the use of diesel in, um, in, in generators. So it's totally possible to do it um, and to benefit from carbon finance. One of the challenge that you may be encountering is the size of your, of your activities. Um, if those are small solar PV kits, then you will likely need quite a lot of them aggregated together at the level of a province maybe uh, to apply. Uh, to carbon finance again because it's a resource intensive process and that if uh, uh, you know one or two solar panels is, is not going to um, you know um, make it uh, worthwhile the, the efforts of uh, the, the you know certification uh, process so so you you can when that's also possible with sort of grid connected larger power plants uh, maybe a fewer number of you would be involved in with that but Things like geothermal, either power plants, solar power plants, sort of utility scale uh, connected to the grids may have the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to benefit from, from carbon finance. 
Does that answer all your questions or? Uh, yes, uh, I've, I've, sorry about that. Um, uh, I've gotten the first question. Now, the other thing I saw when the, there was uh, energy efficient, so I wanted to find out oh, yeah. what falls under that. Oh, energy efficiency here, I think, for um, household cooking devices is a big one. I've mentioned that a few times, so not a surprise. Uh, but it could also be energy efficiency in brick making, energy efficiency um, in charcoal making. It could be energy efficiency uh, in um, industrial processes of, I don't know, various industrial plants uh, that you may have in, in, uh, in, in Zambia and sort of you know, improving the energy efficiency of a, of a boiler, for instance, for drying out tea or coffee. Or, uh, or, you know, I think in Zambia, one that is also relevant is, um, you know, those uh, barns that are used to cure tobacco. They were often not very uh, energy efficient, and so they can be replaced by sort of more energy efficient barns, and that would trigger reduced uh, uh, deforestations and reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Not the, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I hope Roger's question has been answered. In the event that you are, there's some still any other questions that you have, you can still get in touch with us uh, privately. Uh, you can drop your hand now, so you can go to Jack. You can um, ask your question, unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Olivier, for uh, presentation. It's been a, a great one. Uh, it's one uh, I think it's a long time we had such kind of uh, kind of engagement. Uh, my name is Jack Kalipenta. I work for Zambian Governance Foundation. Um, and uh, of course, we are slowly, slowly getting to the uh, the issues of climate change. Uh, it's one of our cross-cutting uh, issues. Now, um, looking at when you consider what you have presented, Olivier, uh, it seems really carbon financing is a big guys and girls club. It's not for it's not for for small groups, you know. It's it's a big game, it's an international big game we are, we are talking about. Why am I saying so? You're looking at just the quantity you know, of, of hectares needed for one to be able to be talking about carbon crediting, 40,000 to 50,000 hectares of, of forest, that's huge, which means it requires a very well organized either movement or organization, I'm talking about Comaco, talking about BCP and others who are involved in it already, these guys with the big financial muscle before you attract any uh, funding from outside. Now, my question is that, does Prospero then plan to venture into brokering? I'm looking at that brokering. Eh? Well, look, we've, as you can see from the, the, the audience that we have, there are a lot of guys doing small, small things all over the country, which can only make sense if there was a blocker, you know, some would brokering, to ensure that all the little, 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 little hectares being done, put together, then they can make this economic sense for carbon credit. Now, is Prospero in that process? Or is Prospero planning to set up, also becoming like a big boy, like maybe Comaco or locally, so that land is acquired for this thing to happen? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Jack, for your uh, question. It's extremely relevant, and I should have mentioned that before, because obviously, uh, Prospero's mission is to serve uh, the SME ecosystem in Zambia. And uh, obviously, when organizing that uh, webinar, we, um, although we are presenting here in that first part some of the general uh, principle of this concept and mechanism, uh, you know, that, that would apply to, 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 to a range of, of organizations. Uh, uh, we also wanted to keep in mind that uh, maybe most of organizations that are attending the, the, this webinar today are uh, rather more active in the SME sector than in larger organizations. So, um, so two things, I guess, I'll, I'll mention in the, in the second part, some of the, some of the things that could be done for maybe the, you know, SMEs to pull resources together. Um, to, to come up with, with um, initiatives that are large enough to benefit from carbon finance. But I will also talk about the, 
role that Prospero is starting to, to take to facilitate uh, a, a better access to carbon finance in Zambia. So that's for the second part. So please bear, bear with us and uh, hopefully this will answer uh, most of your uh, questions. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we, we can go now to Chimfwembe. Quickly ask your question then from Chimfwembe. I think we'll go to uh, Kyle. So I have both questions I think are handled at the same time by Olivia or ourselves. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Olivia. And uh, I've learned a lot so far. My question is um, on uh, carbon capture technology. Um, how does carbon capture technology benefit from carbon financing? And on top of that, maybe I can include also waste to energy uh, incineration with zero emissions uh, because these are new. Uh, in the market in Zambia, but we have organizations uh, that are actually doing them, and I'm one of them. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you just um, uh, specify what you mean by carbon capture or carbon capture and storage? Do you have a, a specific technology in mind? Yes, I have one in mind. Um, uh, it uses, uh, it captures carbon directly from emitting uh, industries and uh, okay. it uses it in uh, construction and stores the CO2 permanent in construction material. That's okay. It. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so those are projects that are, uh, we call them sort of technological carbon removal type of projects, um, are benches that are. Uh, very early stage for most of them. Um, you know, we, we see a range of technology, for instance, capturing carbon directly from the air or burning, uh, uh, you know, a firewood to produce electricity and capturing the carbon that is emitted as part of the process and then burying this carbon into the ground. Um, or as you've mentioned, you know, capturing uh, greenhouse gas emission directly from the exhaust gas of uh, industrial facilities and then using that gas to either burrow into the ground or uh, fit into some construction material. Those are um, often extremely expensive um, processes to, uh, to, to, um, to implement. Um, and uh, and those, those initiatives that are currently doing this sort of things that are able to sell their carbon credits at the moment between $100 and $600 per ton for carbon credits. But this is a very, very tiny market because not many organizations are willing or able to pay that sort of price. And it's still cheaper to support projects that are uh, reforesting lands, for instance, which is another technique of you know, capturing carbon. And so this is, this is something that we'll see developing over time. Uh, this is something that can definitely benefit depending on the technology. Uh, there may exist already um, carbon quantification methodologies. So in theory, that's, that's the sort of technology that could definitely benefit from carbon finance. But again, it needs to be large enough and you need to make sure you have a market for your carbon credits if the cost of producing a single ton you know, is, is in the range of 100 to 60, uh, 100, as, I've, uh, as I've mentioned. On the waste to energy um, power plants, that's something that, that is a technology that is definitely eligible here. The source of greenhouse gas emissions you would be reducing is possibly twofold. The first one, um, you would potentially prevent greenhouse gas emissions from uh, waste decaying in open fields. Uh, another source of greenhouse gas emissions you may be reducing is that with sort of waste, with that waste, uh, you will producing you'll be producing either heat or electricity, potentially fitting the, the national grid if it's a large uh, enough of a power plant. And then again, here you might be displacing electricity that would have been produced with a, a more carbon intensive uh, source of, uh, of, of emission of, uh, of energy. So here there are two potential sources of, of greenhouse gas emissions you may be able to mitigate through a waste to energy a power plant, depending on the technology, depending on, on, on the range of, of parameters. But yeah, it is eligible and, it's, and, and there are a range of, uh, of such products in the world that have been benefiting from from uh, from carbon finance. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Olivia. Um, I hope Chimpwembe, you've been answered that quickly. Uh, in the event that you still have anything else, you can easily uh, get in touch. So I think we'll go to Kyle and uh, Miyuki will be the last person. I Hi, I hope that you can hear me right now. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Olivia, for the, the second session, very, That is when yeah. we now tackle all the questions. Okay, can I ask a question now? Yes, go ahead, please, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Olivia. It was very in, uh, informative information that I was very uh, happy that I could join this, uh, this presentation. My question is actually to understand your business scheme. So for example, like the, the, all the information is very interesting, um, but I was trying to see if you, um, Prospero is uh, it's trying to become a carbon developer, or for, for example, like what I mean is like, for example, getting the carbon credit uh, sharing from the the participants or let's say your partner, or are you more like the, your consulting consultant side or writing the uh, project documents like and etc. What is your uh, the business scheme? If you can hopefully provide us a little bit more details. Thanks a lot, uh, Miyuki, for your question. And if that's okay, that's a similar question to one raised uh, just before. And that's mm -hmm. you know we, we're going to be. Yeah, I was like planning to deal to if 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 you if you intend to stay uh, for the second part, which will be a bit shorter, uh, you will mm -hmm. have the answer to your question. Uh, but okay. uh, uh, so uh, yeah, Prospero intends to 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 be more active as a facilitator. Uh, mm -hmm. in the market. So uh, playing a range of, of facilitation uh, facilitation roles, including uh, maybe some of those that you've mentioned. We, as uh, Armacop Climate Impacts, are uh, advising, supporting, working with Prospero on providing some of the technical expertise required to enable to enable the, 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 some of this facilitation. So, uh, so in short, is the answer is, 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 is yes. We're still listening to the and, and Prosper is still listening to the markets to, to participate, and that's why your feedback is very, um, uh, very useful and very, very uh, important, uh, so that we understand, you know, what are concerns, what are the needs, and we've already started sort of uh, putting a, a range of activities that we think could be facilitating uh, the access to carbon funds to to a number of you who may be attending the call today. All right, thank you um, very much. Can we have Kao? Kao. Hi, Olivia. Kao? Yeah, I'm here. Um, which co-benefit standard is preferred by buyers or Vera process? So CCB or SD Vista? I know CCB has been preferred, preferred by buyers in the past is what it feels like. Is there a shift more towards SD Vista co-benefit standards? Um, is there an like? Is it more intensive for SD Vista or CCB? What are they, and like? Where is the market going on those co-benefit standards specific to Vera? Um, so Vera came up with SD Vista as a response to what uh, a competing scheme is doing. The gold standard has been basically asking all the all the project that that you know wanted to issue carbon credits to be able to demonstrate that they support at least three of the sustainable development goal. And so the SD Vista is basically a framework that enables projects to track impacts of uh, as many sustainable development goals as they, as they wish. Uh, it's a, uh, a carbon benefit standard that is a lot lighter than the climate community and biodiversity uh, 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 standards and, and its requirements uh, for um, you know, monitoring notably the, the impact of the project. And so CCB is still the very much the preferred uh, standard by everyone uh, on the market when it comes to projects uh, related to land use. CCB is restricted to land use projects of forestry, agriculture, mostly. And is the visa, I guess, to some extent can be perceived as a complementary um, standard that can that is often applied to non-land related uh, project, although some uh, forest project have, have applied the SD uh, Vista in addition to the CCB. But the market, uh, the market value very much, values very much the, the CCB 
um, standards, com climate community, community and biodiversity uh, standards. And SD Visa is only certified, I think, about 10 projects. It's a bit early to say what sort of um, premium this will comment on, on the market. Um, but, uh, but the goal, an organization like the Gold Standard sort of has this sort of integrated certifications of carbon and non-carbon uh, benefits uh, as well. And it, and, it, and it has tended in the past to trigger higher prices than those projects certified under the VCS uh, only without any um, sort of co-certification or, or non-carbon benefit certification. Great, thank you very much. Do you know if it's possible to stack CCB and SD Vista onto the same project, or can you only do one co-benefit? No, it's, pos no it's, it's possible. They're kind of complementary, I guess. Huh? SD Vista is looking at uh, impacts on the from the angle of sustainable development, develop, sustainable development goals, and CCB is very much focused on local social impacts, uh, climate change adaptation benefits, and biodiversity benefits. So it's a lot more focused and, and, and details and, and, and or deeper into this. Huh? It's possible. Uh, uh, there's one product in Indonesia that has done it called Rimbaraya. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, everyone. So uh, let's just take a five minutes uh, break, then we can resume and go, go direct into the second uh, session and thereafter we'll handle all the questions including those that uh, have not been answered but uh, in the chat thank you very much so we'll resume after five minutes thank you masters can you do you mind sort of giving me back the the, the the hand so i can sort of start sharing my presentation uh, can you go again uh, can you please uh, give give back the hand to me so that i can share my screen again all right okay 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 your host now yes i am thank you so maybe we just take a five minutes break then we can resume okay okay
Hi, Olivia. Are you there? Yes, indeed, Moses. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can get you. So I think maybe the five minutes is up, so we can just uh, go straight into the, the second session. Then we can have uh, questions uh, thereafter. Thank you. Okay. So I just tried to, uh, at regular interviews, maybe just try to allow in uh, people in the waiting room. Thanks. Okay, let me try. There's only three of them. So that should be good. Um, okay, um, Caroline, Hope, uh, Gelsum, Gelsum, you are now admitted, if you can hear us. Every, well, very good morning to those who have recently joined us. We will be starting the second part of this webinar. Um, conscious that we say that we would, you know, be closing this in uh, sort of 40, 55, yeah, 45 minutes, so uh, more or less, um, 40 minutes. So I'll try to, I think the second part will be shorter because I've sort of presented most of the um, contextual part in the first uh, in the first section. I was a little bit easier. This this part is aimed to be focused a little bit more onto SMEs and Zambia and, and, and Prospero, the role of Prospero, uh, although we'll come back with some of the principles that I've mentioned in, in, in the in the first part. Um, so we'll try to run through that sort of fairly quickly so that we have enough uh, room and time for everyone to ask a, a question. So yeah, do something that was uh, specific to the context of uh, Zombie and hopefully you have felt that, felt that as well in, in the first part, but that second part here, if I can sort of, okay, here we go. So those are, you know, I guess maybe repeating a little bit and then going into a bit more detail into the, the some of the activities that are eligible. Those are uh, the high priority sector sectors for carbon finance. Those are sectors that have been mentioned in the in, in the national aid to mine contribution. Those are the sectors that are uh, the largest co contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, and and obviously where uh, there is uh, the most room for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and for uh, benefiting from uh, from carbon finance so uh, you know we've we've talked about them before but forestry and land use energy waste management in forestry and land use those are activities that are uh, in theory um, eligible to issue carbon credits so forest conservations I've, I've mentioned quite a few activities and uh, previously um, tree planting it could be for timber constructions. It could be for for energy. If it substitutes to other sources of, you know, uh, uh, non renewable uh, uh, biomass uh, used by household on the industry, um, agroforestry is also uh, uh, the sort of activities that that could be sort of aggregated at the larger scale and benefit from from carbon finance from the carbon sequestered in in the tree, and as well as uh, the promotion of the you know uh, fertilizers with with um, high nutrient efficiencies or um, sort of more organic sort of fertilizers, and then sort of agroecology type of agriculture, uh, conservation agriculture, crop diversifications um, have the potential to store more carbon in the soil. But again, that's the sort of activities that will need to take place at a larger scale, and that would need sort of an organization to kind of aggregate uh, several um, small uh, older farmers. Uh, energy, uh, production of low carbon electricity, you've mentioned hydro, geothermal, solar, uh, wind, obviously, but, you know, uh, you know, solar, it could be, it could be solar uh, PV panels, but it could also be solar lanterns, possibly sort of displacing the use of kerosene uh, with uh, at the household uh, premises. Um, domestic energy efficiency measures. So this has the potential to trigger a lot of emission reductions. So those are sort of those improved cooking stove programs that I've mentioned in the past. I've also also mentioned uh, in, um, industrial energy efficiency measures, uh, manufacturing of, of, of charcoal uh, energy efficiency, possibly in the mining industry. 
as well, depending on, on the processes and the source of energy used in, in, in some of the mining processes. There may be potential to implement sort of more or uh, well, well, less carbon intensive um, um, sources of, uh, of energy uh, to um, extract and, and mine. And uh, waste management, we've, we've mentioned that before, um, and the, the you know, potential to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions is a lot lower than energy and, and agriculture and, and, and forestry, but still there may be some potential, um, but that may not be very relevant to, to, to SMEs. Uh, it could be, for instance, the waste to energy uh, power plants mentioned uh, earlier in the discussion. Um, here is a case study again that we've done on the national parks again so not no i think it would involve the uh smes and in, in that some of the activities might be implemented or or triggering or or um, stimulating the private sector uh, here we have noticed that in a lot of the zambian national parks so so they're covered by Miamba forest and local communities are highly dependent on the natural resources of the sparks, including poaching, encroachments, deforestation for uh, charcoal making, farming activities, and 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 uh, um, and um, a range of activities around sustainable agriculture practices, agroforestry, sustainable rice production, beekeeping uh, may uh, be funded through the sale of carbon credits and implemented through or with the support or leads to the development of, of you know uh, SMEs in, in the specific uh, in the specific sectors here the study uh, that we that we've done uh, that is kind of uh, confidential here and it's one of the specific uh, park uh, we we found that um, over uh, uh, an area of 100,000 hectares again it's very large um, I'm aware and and this is a a project that has the potential to reduce um, about 200,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year, sold at five to ten dollars per unit. That would, um, you know, uh, generate a revenue of one to two million per year to finance activities preventing deforestation and degradation, including potentially funding, um, you know, SMEs that are active in the uh, in the area of the of, of the national park. There's another one here again. I think that would apply to a fairly large. Uh, power plants you know here the example of a, of a geothermal power plants that we looked into that uh, was a potential capacity of 10 um, megawatt um, you know the 90 percent of, of zambian energy is generated through through hydropower and then coal and, and diesel to a much smaller um, extent uh, but their climate change may increase the risk of a drought making hydropower generation unreliable. Uh, one of the potential solutions to that is the development of geothermal power in Zambia. Uh, the, this, you know, uh, Zambian power producers or companies has been researching uh, the potential that the country since 2011 has started developing plans in southern Zambia for 10 megawatt power, uh, power plants. Obviously, this power plant being potentially one of the first one in the country is facing a lot of issues and that's where carbon finance comes in as a tool to support the funding or to provide this sort of power plant with an additional stream of revenue in addition to 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 the sale of electricity this power plant might be able to sell carbon credits so here carbon credits would basically make the functional profile of the plants more uh, attractive enabling this project developer to overcome the, the 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 you know investment barriers that they are uh, they are they are uh, uh, facing. Uh, that's a project that we have calculated for 10 megawatt that has the potential to generate about 50,000 ton of carbon dioxide or 50,000 carbon credits every year. That can be sold at between four and ten dollars at the moment, and this can change, and so would we'll generate between three and seven million dollars over a 14 um, year uh, period of uh, period of time. So here again, carbon credits sort of feeding into the business model of the power plants and enabling the power plant and the product developers to alleviate or overcome uh, a barrier and challenges a city with you know, political barriers, institutional barriers, 
uh, uh, you know, technical barriers uh, when when sort of implementing these sort of uh, innovating uh, innovating uh, facilities. And another one here, maybe for some of you who may be active working on the, uh, you know, with with households that have or with farmers. Sorry, um, one way to reduce the consumptions of unsustainably sourced uh, firewood um, is, which is the you know the primary source of, of domestic uh, eating and cooking in Zambia, used by 88% of households, is to implement this kind of of, of you know. Of, local and farm level by digesters uh, that uh, would uh, depending on the context cost around eight hundred dollars to uh, to implement and this uh, each of these has the capacity to generate 4.6 carbon credits every year uh, for a period of you know 10 to potentially 21 uh, 21 years um, so for instance for a program that would uh, again that's a large program it doesn't have to be that large, but would enable the the, the you know implementation of ten thousand biodigesters. Um, then it could generate forty six carbon forty six thousand carbon credits every year. So the five to ten dollars per unit that would that would represent an income of two hundred fifty two hundred thirty to four hundred sixty thousand dollars per year over the lifetime of the technology or the project. So here again, SMEs might not be the project implementers, but they may be. Uh, you know, able to tap into the potential for uh, constructing these uh, biogas tanks and systems and, and, and putting uh, the, the, the gas stoves that will be plugged into those, uh, you know, biogas tanks that's usually only suitable for um, households uh, that are uh, farming and that have livestock, a few head of livestock to produce um, animal waste to fit into this biogas power plant. Uh, here specifically, the uh, Zambia those uh, maybe may not be new to most of you, uh, but uh, still wanted to run through them as this is something that we have uh, identified, carrying out a, a diagnostic, and uh, and that we intend with uh, Prospero to try to tackle over uh, over time. One of the gaps we've identified in relation to carbon finance in Zambia is the lack of capacity and knowledge around the carbon markets. And that's the reason we're doing this webinar today. And there will be a, a workshop uh, next uh, uh, month and, and, um, and audibly around the potential for activities to be certified and selling carbon credits and, and the role that the private sector uh, can, uh, can play. We've, we've identified, I mean, I guess possibly this human, the lack of, of capacity and knowledge which is also related very much to the gap in institutional capacity. Um, you know, when, and, and there, there's a, a, you know, a little or too little uh, information shared around this mechanism by the various um, you know, ministries. But it's also very difficult to um, gather the data that is sometimes required to uh, you know, uh, assess emission reduction for uh, Project and that may be held by, uh, you know, government um, agencies. We also seeing a, a, a lack, I think, of of, uh, of awareness and, and corporations, and lack of, of communication interactions between actors involved in funding and supporting carbon projects. And so, our intention through that webinar, which is the beginning of a series of of events and and, and facilitations uh, activities that will be implementing with Prospero you know, intend to address uh, that and try to increase awareness and cooperation in Zambia around, uh, you know, common finance for uh, ideally SMEs to benefit from, from this mechanism. As you've seen, you know, uh, by the, 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 the size of the project that I've mentioned, you know, it only sort of makes sense to certify projects through carbon finance for fairly large operations. Uh, so, it is because there's a fairly high transaction cost associated with carbon certification. This is something that is changing over time as we're seeing sort of more technology being used to support sort of smaller um, project uh, holders or, or activities implemented to benefit from carbon uh, uh, finance. And, um, and uh, so that's, that's one of the barriers that we are, we're seeing uh, as well. And then we'll, Obviously, see how this uh, can be tackled by sort of providing uh, 
potential support. So some project developers who may have the capacity to develop project with potential to uh, generate carbon and offsets. There are also other, um, you know, uh, challenges associated with um, the social demographic constraints of Zambia, which you're very likely, unless you're doing all your business in Lusaka, you're very likely familiar with is the low density of the population in terms, you know, when in such a large, uh, you know, uh, countries and can be challenging sometimes to implement activities at, at the provincial or at the national um, scale. And that's what it would potentially take. Um, for some carb from some for some activities to benefit from carbon finance, there are some challenges around the management of land and and um, uh, and and the clarity around or the lack of clarity around um, management and, and ownership and and so that can uh, be a challenge when it comes to discussing with landowners between landowners and product developers. You know, having discussions around the the property of carbon related to the related to the land, um, and a lot of sort of fractions and small sort of forest dependent communities. Um, but obviously, uh, to see more funding from international uh, organizations into into you know into Zambia, we we see uh, other sort of more structural risk related to. Um, you know, well, uh, including sorry, high currency risk uh, and the funding of, of infrastructure, uh, but that's the sort of barriers that you'd likely sort of face as, as an SME, I guess, to 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 raise maybe a external uh, external funding. So one of the I should mention here, one of the the carbon finance can be a little complex and and you know and, and resource intensive, but in terms of structuring funding, it often is a little bit simpler uh, than than the usual sort of you know. Uh, capital raising that you may expect, for instance, if you want to raise capital for your um, your ventures, because it's all about buying and, and selling a commodity, the carbon credits, rather than investing into venture or business most of the time. So it tends to uh, to be a little bit simpler to, or, you know, there are some challenges that you may be facing uh, if you were to raise capital for your organization or company that you may not be facing. Uh, uh, using uh, working with the carbon market. Um, some uh, some of the some of the things that we think will will sort of help alleviate some of this barrier um, around sort of knowledge sharing, um, building a centralized and easy to access carbon project experience sharing platform. You mentioned there are there are about seventeen uh, seventeen. Um, uh, uh, so 16 projects are um, you know out there and then um, there's probably a lot of lessons to be learned from those project developers and uh, you know and having a centralized platforms that enable to share experience but also informations would um, address you know one of the questions I think uh, answered earlier and where, where can I find this information who do I need to contact um, so that's you know possibly something that that, that Prospero could do over time um, I think uh, you know, you know, there's there's, there's a good potential for a, a greater cooperation between public and the private uh, sectors in relation to carbon finance. The, the you know the public uh, sectors will have uh, interest in having the private sectors being involved into helping you know the governments to meet its own climate change uh, commitments. And so we are um, hoping that we will be seeing this sort of uh, initiatives in, in in the coming uh, years. Through either international funding or through um, you know funding uh, that could be provided by organizations like uh, Prospera, um, you know I've, I've mentioned that here, but you know uh, uh, similarly to the first one around knowledge sharing and corporations uh, between public and the private sector, we think that that this is something that can be alleviated or, or, you know, if not sort of uh, fixed uh, uh, through a centralized uh, platforms. Uh, um, but simply, I think one, one, what's missing in Zambia at the moment is, is the champion that is really sort of taking everything that, that, that is out there in terms of information and, and bringing it, bringing it to, to organizations like, uh, like uh, or, you know, like individual like yours, like you, who may be interested in setting up a, a carbon, a carbon project. Um, 
training courses in carbon finance and its potential. So that's you know part of what we do here. But uh, there needs to be sort of a more longer term ongoing uh, sharing of, of information uh, around the use of carbon uh, finance. Um, and I guess independently, you know, something that Prospero is doing is, you know, advocating to reinforce fiduciary standards to promote trustful organizations to invest in Zambia from um, uh, from abroad, but also um, having Zambian organization, including, you know, financial organizations to uh, be able to apply sort of best practice and, and to benefit from external funding to themselves, provide SMEs with um, funding lines uh, related to uh, mission production activities. Um, what else here? Um, some of the seeing at the moment that uh, we think will somehow be addressed in the coming months and years. There are still some, you know, we, we've entered um, recently into the Paris Agreement era when it comes to climate change, uh, climate change sort of uh, governance, international uh, governance. And, uh, um, and it's still unclear how the government of Zambia wants to, wants carbon finance. Uh, and notably Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which is about international cooperation mechanism, including carbon finance, would sort of, you know, how the, the Zambian government see the you know, carbon finance, sorry, sort of uh, supporting the, the, the uh, climate change uh, uh, objectives of the, of the country. It's, um, it's, it's still a little, a little unclear how emission reduction from projects set up by the private sector will be accounted in the country's emission reduction commitment targets. It isn't clear whether the government of Zambia will impose a price target on carbon credits issued from a project taking place in the country. And it's also a little bit unclear whether Zambia will set up a share of, prof of proceeds, uh, which would be a number, you know, a percentage of carbon credits from projects uh, to be sort of uh, going back into the national uh, greenhouse gas emission um, inventory. Um, so we are, we are still seeing a, a kind of a lack of institutional leadership and support to track carbon finance, but that's something that we uh, with Prospero sort of intend to, um, to, to, to address and sort of supporting institutions uh, and to, um, to gear up and to, uh, you know, uh, uh, provide uh, guidance uh, to to the private sectors for them to be uh, for it to be involved in, with with carbon finance. Um, uh, potential benefits of carbon finance. Uh, you probably got it by uh, by now, uh, but uh, we think that you know international, both international and local organisations can can be earning revenue. Uh, to uh, protect uh, Zambian natural uh, resources, um, and we think we think the carbon finance is, is has got a great potential in in, in Zambia, and that uh, that the you know uh, uh, this is notably an opportunity for the Ministry of of, of Tourism and all all um, SMEs involved in this uh, sectors to you know uh, uh, generate uh, revenue from uh, conservation. Um, the role of SMEs in, in, in carbon markets. Um, so here in terms of, of what, you know, what to expect from the public uh, sector, and I'll go into the role, you know, of SMEs, um, you know, despite the barriers and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we were starting seeing favorable regulation and public sector support to SMEs uh, to, to, to play a role in the carbon market. Um, and and uh, uh, and Prospero is at the forefront of you know advocating for for SMEs to you know to, to be able to evolve into a favorable uh, business environment, including one that that enabled them to tap into uh, you know such an innovative uh, financing mechanism. Uh, we we think that uh, different governments uh, and, and institutions should get together to contribute to a particular development outcomes to facilitate the mainstreaming. 
of, of agenda. So that's something that Prospera is also uh, working on. Um, uh, we have identified the Zambian Development Agency as a key partner for helping interested stakeholders and private sectors getting support for um, setting up their project. They are um, also thinking about sort of supporting large scale uh, project through carbon uh, finance. And uh, we are involved into multilateral and bilateral donors, uh, sort of networking events and capacity building events. And we think there's a growing interest for from this community to support, uh, you know, the Zambian private sectors to be able to tap into this financing uh, mechanism. Um, but obviously, there are still a lot of challenges, um, you know, for SMEs to accessing long term financing for climate mitigation projects, not only through carbon finance, but also through, um, I guess, you know, green financing lines, uh, you know, from, from sort of uh, local uh, um, financial institutions. Um, so I think there are obviously an obvious challenge for SMEs to benefit from a carbon finance related to the size of their activities. And so uh, one of the one of the one of the actions that we and, and Prospero will intend to put in place, but also that will require all of you SMEs to be you know actively engaged as taking action as part of the business coalition or advocacy groups with common interest to uh, advocate for um, you know facilitating uh, environments and and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and knowledge sharing uh, environments. So this could be done, for example, for, you know, large, uh, through large trading, um, you know, groups or business groups in, in, in the countries that have common interest and that may be sort of uh, able to um, have a direct uh, communication lines with a number of uh, ministries. Um, it's important for SMEs. Uh, again, you know, we've talked about waste, we've talked about forestry, we've talked about energy, but obviously here we're looking at projects that have the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and obviously even to find the sectors with the greatest mitigation potential is key to start, you know, looking at, looking at, start looking at the, this mechanism. You know, if you are um, in a sector that that is, you know, that is a very low source of, of greenhouse gas emissions, for instance, maybe transportation, uh, in Zambia is not particularly relevant when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, that it's unlikely that if you're SME active in this field, that you will be you know, likely to be able to benefit from this financing um, mechanism. Uh, important for SMEs to identify barriers to, to scaling up uh, measures that uh, enable the decrease of, of you know, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, identifying uh, you know, I think this this idea of, of you know uh, federating in the sectors mentioned on the left hand side, forestry, energy, waste management, small players that are active in either manufacturing, distributing, promoting, servicing organizations to to adopt practice that that reduce greenhouse gas emissions have the potential to use this financing mechanism. Simply, if you're not large enough an S, of an SME, obviously, an SME can be you know, 10 people, but it could also be potentially two or 300, you know, uh, staff. And, and, you know, there's uh, are two type of organization that will have very different sort of capacity, capacity to, to be using this, uh, this mechanism. But if you are uh, um, a fairly small organizations, I would uh, recommend that, uh, that you find, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe go and find some of your competitors or collaborators and, uh, and get together and see how, large of, of, a, of a project you could potentially potentially be implementing uh, or activities implementing uh, uh, together identifying uh, the, the scale of opportunities uh, for for the promotion of climate change technologies or um, practices and the last step really I think which is the the first step of getting your activities potentially funded through carbon finance is structuring concept not to demonstrate um, how subsidies as in the, the future sale of carbon credits or the the, the forward sale of carbon credits will enable uh, a low carbon practice 
So again, you know, as SMEs, you won't you won't necessarily be promoting a, a, a product or practice that will actually be enabling emission reductions, and that mechanism might not be well fit for you. But if you do, um, then again, I think structuring, you know, um, a concept note presenting how a large scale promotion of your product or your services um, could enable a significant amount or reasonably large amount of emission reductions, uh, you know, uh, through subsidies, for instance, you know, you may be promoting a product or service that is a little too expensive to some of the uh, consumers, customers you want to address. Then maybe carbon finance can be used to subsidize uh, the cost of your product or service to enable a wider spread adoption across a, 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 an area, including across the, across the country. So that's how carbon finance is used by many organizations as used to subsidize the you know, production facility, distributions, the cost of products, uh, the, the you know, training, uh, um, distribution channels. There's really, I think, uh, um, in many, the many different way that you know the, the the revenue of carbon finance can can be used but again you need to be able to demonstrate that this revenue will enable you know you to scale up your activities in places where it's not been you know scaled up for instance and that it leads to uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction um just looking at time now yeah um Two, 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 three um, examples here of initiatives in, in Zambia uh, that are uh, a lot smaller scale here. I think that there's one here um, funded by uh, Dutch bank, Rabobank. Um, they're working with uh, farmers on uh, financing uh, agroforestry measures. So here, instead of going through, uh, you know, the complex carbon finance mechanism that I've described before, they've, they've basically made up their own way of, um, you know, uh, uh, enabling farmers to issue carbon assets in a much simpler way, you know, standardized. They are recruiting farmers and they're basically telling them if you implement this sort of activities, we'll help you monitor carbon impacts on your parcels and then we will give you uh you know i don't know five ten dollars per ton of carbon dioxide that that we have been accounting uh that uh, you know as part of the project uh, activity um it's not a, usually a carbon credits that will be sold or traded on the international carbon markets it's kind of a scheme that is proprietary to rabble bank but that's one uh, good example of how much smaller scale farming could potentially be benefiting from, from carbon uh, uh, finance uh, or in the agricultural uh, or agroforestry sector. But that's also the same thing is, is currently happening on, on, you know, on the forestry sector for reforesting or agricultural sector for changing um, land um, practices. So a scheme could be set up at the national level, for instance, by an organization like Prospero or any other organization really, uh, you know, and, and set up a list of criteria under which farmers might be benefit, be able to benefit from from, from carbon finance uh, by implementing a certain range of, of practices that we need to be monitored. Um, the one here in the waste recycling sector, it's, it's an example from uh, South um, Africa. Uh, again, it's it's uh, an independent certification standard called Credible Carbon, which is South African um, certification um, scheme, and that has come up with simplified guidances for uh, project developers, um, and not project developers, from for you know small 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 um, landowners and and communities to benefit from. Uh, you know, selling carbon credits uh, or recycling, uh, you know, a, a range of, uh, of waste uh, stream. And here in Zambia, we have as well an organization, I think Belgian organization called uh, We Forest, um, that has started, uh, you know, registering, I think, a reforestation scheme at the national level, which means that they could potentially be onboarding. Uh, small scale farmers uh, or landowners who um, 
you could sort of either change their agricultural practices or forestry or restore the land, uh, you know, by by onboarding one existing uh, sort of umbrella project. Um, I think. Um, let me just have a look here. I think I'm just gonna finish with that here. Uh, so some of the things that that um, um, needs to happen, you know, and one of the sorry first steps that we usually take when looking at considering concept notes and and, and uh, SMEs or or individuals uh, sort of IDs uh, of projects, we look at a range of so those five criteria to confirm whether the project could benefit from carbon finance. We confirm, we look at the product um, additionality, which is, you know, this arguments that the project will not, or the product activities, the activities will not take place without the expected revenue from carbon finance, which I've mentioned earlier. So that's, that's a concept that needs to be applied to any activities who want to benefit from carbon finance. We look at whether there exists uh, a, carbon account, a carbon accounting and monitoring um, methodology. And the certification standard that is often the case in, in the project types that have um, or sorry activity types that I've mentioned uh, during this webinar um, we uh, try to have an idea in quantifying emission reduction from the activities uh, that again give us an idea of whether uh, the certification process may or may not be too resource intensive for the project size and we're looking at the project's financial viability with uh, the integrated uh, sale of carbon credits as a, an additional or uh, entire sort of new, entirely new uh, revenue um, uh, stream. Um, so in Zambia, here's I think uh, the answer to one of the questions raised earlier, who's, who else is, is, is out there? Um, so those are carbon credits issued by the various uh, uh, organizations. Um, I'll skip that. Prospero is um, looking for taking an active role into supporting SMEs in Zambia to benefit from carbon finance. And here are several ways that Prospero intends to, to, have, to support SMEs. The first one is developing initiatives capable of attracting financial support from external um, investors. So setting up and uh, uh, initial uh, development and implementation cost of some of activities that are, uh, you know, that will be sort of deemed or assessed sort of worthwhile in terms of emission, the potential to generate emission reductions and generate sort of um, non-carbon uh, benefits. Um, Prospera could, could be acting as the buyer of carbon credits or co-buyer of carbon credits as it could sort of, you know, uh, make the link between um, organization in Zambia and potentially international uh, financing, uh, financial uh, sponsor. Uh, Prospero, and that's what we're doing here, what we started doing here, uh, intends to build knowledge and capacity on the carbon market and setting up appropriate support structures and business coalitions for as many SMEs as possible to be able to, to support uh, you know, Zambia's climate change agenda and benefit from, from the revenue of carbon finance. And um, another uh, 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 way that Prospero intends to support is, is enabling projects to, uh, to go through the certification process and, and monitor the, their greenhouse gas emissions to, to ensure that, you know, beyond the project certification project are enable activities. Sorry, I should say uh, activities are enabled to generate carbon assets over a long period of time and benefit from that uh, new uh, revenue um, stream. So that includes providing services, sort of technical advisory services um, that uh, Amacop will like would likely also uh, uh, provide so provide services to private operators that are unlikely to have the capacity to design, develop, or operate carbon project at scale and on their own. So, um, so I encourage you to reach out to, to, to Prospero if after that webinar you think that you may be able to, um, you know, implement activities that, that have the potential to, to uh, be eligible to carbon finance. Um, um, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop here and just, you know, conscious of time, leave a bit of room for additional uh, questions. Um, Moses, back to you. Uh, 
Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, at this end, we seem to go uh, into the questions. Maybe we'll just start uh, the ones which are in the chat, which some of them might have directly responded to uh, the people that had uh, asked the questions. If you want to are there, you can read the questions. If not, I can start, just do that. Hi Moses, um, there's really quite a lot of them. Uh, so maybe those that I've raised can go first. All right, okay, so maybe we can start with uh, George. You can uh, unmute and ask your question then from George. Yeah, we can start with George. Uh, Moses, thank you so much. And Olivia, thank you so much for a very insightful presentation. Um, so mine, mine is not necessarily a question, but a comment. Um, mine is not a question, but a comment. And, and it's really a quick one. I mean, uh, obviously, first of all, commending your work um, in this area. Very, very critical going forward. I think we've seen uh, the, the Republican president talked about carbon finance as being a key source of climate finance in his address to, to National Assembly. Uh, and the minister as well, Minister of Finance, has mentioned in this budget. So the, the one comment really is around the fragmented landscape. And, and I, I agree with Olivier in this regard, um, because there's a lot of information asymmetry. There's a lot you know, there's a lot of happening in silos and we need to find a way of just breaking these silos down. And I say this because as we speak, um, there's a very active um, team at the Ministry of Green Economy and Environment working on um, matters to do with um, uh, you know, the carbon markets. Uh, they're revising the national policy on climate change. We should see a new a revised version soon. They're also working on a climate bill that is going to regulate both the, that is likely to regulate the Article 6 uh, or the Paris Agreement sort of credits as well as the voluntary markets. Um, so um, so it's so very critical that we go close to that. Um, they've also set up a technical committee um, of eminent secretaries and ministers that 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 will uh, in essence um first of all approve um, the old kyoto agreement cdm projects uh but but they'll also be looking at the article six projects in addition to this the government has secured funding uh to basically scale up markets and this this um and zambia has been appointed as one of about four four countries in the world the others being colombia Pakistan and Thailand, where, you know, I think the German government is basically financing the, the regularization of carbon markets, uh, and they've contracted about three or four consultants to do this. There was a workshop that took place in September. There was another one that took place back in April. Um, and it's a shame that this information is not open to the public. Um, so I think one, one thing that's really critical is we need to work on breaking down the barriers. Uh, there's a lot happened in the government that most people are not aware of and will be caught by surprise. Some of the barriers, in essence, are being broken down. Um, so yeah, so my comment, uh, it's a bit of a long one, but uh, just to commend Prospero for this fantastic. And, and, and just for us then to look um, at ways where we can collaborate with government more closely uh, as, as, as um, obviously business, but, but, but I would also sort of maybe urge that we, we kind of um, link up with the Ministry of Green Economy and Environment uh, who are driving a lot of this change and it may affect what we are talking about today unbeknownst to us. Uh, so that really was my my comment, um, uh, Moses and Olivia. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, George. Uh, your comments are very well valid and we'll take that into consideration. Uh, just also to emphasize that uh, there is need for us to create like this large platform where we collaborate, uh, government as well as those from the private sector, NGOs so that we consistently uh, share information so that we can have more uh, accrued uh, benefits to the communities ultimately whom we are serving. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip. You can unmute and ask your question. Uh, in the process, maybe Olivia, you can just go back to the Prospero slide, the one which shows the value which, yeah, that one, thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Yeah, my, my name is uh, Philip Ngongo from um, Zambian Commodity Exchange. So I was, I was actually looking at um, some of the projects that uh, have been implemented in Zambia. And I was looking forward to hear you guys talk about uh, CEC. So I think there was a time when uh, CEC was processing uh, soybeans for biodiesel. Um, and that biodiesel is obviously blended to you know, fossil fuel. And I don't know so much about the chemistry of, uh, you know, fuels and all that, but my understanding is that uh, obviously that has a positive impact in, uh, you know, um, reducing the emission of uh, carbon in the atmosphere. So, but then that project, again, is also linked to, to farmers, because, you know, for CEC to process this biodiesel, they have to buy soybeans from, uh, say, uh, small scale farmers creating an, an impact. Um, as, as a business development person, now myself, I'm actually trying to find market for the farmers and uh, obviously find a way in which maybe our activities can be linked to this emerging market, the, the carbon financing. And uh, also, the other component, again, as the business development person, now myself, is uh, Obviously, the aspect of uh, investment also, because these farmers may need money for them to scale up production. So there could be some investors who are interested to invest in these farmers. So I don't know if um, Prospero is, is open, because I, I don't know if there's anyone from CEC, but I think this is something that we can take up as, as ZAMES and see how it can be pushed in, in this agenda. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if this is a question for Prospero, but happy to jump in from a technical perspective, maybe on this uh, quickly. Just wanted to mention two things, I guess. One, um, issues that is being faced across the world uh, when it comes to producing biofuel is the uh, potential competition between uh, food needs, you know, competition for land or food versus uh, energy crops. Uh, so there may be sometimes some restrictions as to what uh, you can uh, claim and, uh, or, or your, the ability of your activities to be registered as a carbon product if, if there is a, you know, I obviously clearly see what you mean here in terms of the, the potential economic uh, benefits from, for, for, for farmers, but there are also other sort of considerations that will need to be getting into the, the equations and notably in terms of, of how, you know, what this means for, for land potentially uh, conflicting with, with you know, uh, food security. Uh, but that's not a hard stop. I just wanted to mention that that this is something that will need to be, you know, taken into consideration when designing such a such an intervention. The second thing is that, uh, um, you know, I confirmed that they, they, there is possibility and the, the potential for uh, reducing uh, emissions by displacing, um, you know, diesel or, or uh, uh, gas with, uh, you know, biodiesel. Emission reduction then would need to take a, a, will take place where you displace, you know, one source of energy for another. And so if this um, source of uh, energy consumption is very diffuse like cars, then it may be very challenging for such initiative to be able to demonstrate the actual benefit of the product. And it's a lot more uh, doable if this uh, biofuel is then feeding into um, in, in industrial or several industrial facilities. 
where you'll be able to more easily demonstrate the link between your production of biofuel and the displacement of you know uh, EV fuel oil, for example, in an industrial um, process. So, you know, I think there's a potential here. Uh, there's quite a few technical um, um, considerations to be to be have in, in structuring such a such an initiative. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that response, Olivia. So, uh, Philip, so in the event that uh, we've not adequately responded to uh, your questions and comments, you can quickly get in touch with us. I think just by uh, responding or writing to that email which you had received uh, the invite from. Thank you very much. So, we also had the hand by Abraham. And just before Abraham comes in, uh, there are some concerns, I think, where slide 48, uh, slide 50, and sl slide 51, people thought that maybe it was uh, a bit rushed. So maybe if you could just uh, go back to those slides, Olivia. Slide 48, 50, and 51, thank you. Yeah, I went quickly through that because I think we sort of uh, kind of mentioned that through one of the questions that was right at the end of the first uh, round. This is sort of providing a um a snapshot of the situation in zambia when it comes to parties that are uh, currently involved or have a project it's really just a short list um, we are seeing increased um, interest from project developers facilitators intermediaries financial sponsors and those are more to be seen as potentially i guess the uh, the organizations that that you know that have been able to tap into that mechanism as, as you know as early entering into the market, product developers. Um, I think this also goes to say that uh, uh, among even among the local product developers that are considered as early movers, a lot of them uh, are um, have been using the services of external consultants because of maybe the lack of. Uh, uh, knowledge of this uh, mechanism in, in, in Zambia. And so what we're trying to do here, um, sort of Amacop and Prospero, is to try to see how we're able to build this capacity in Zambia. Obviously, Amacop is mostly international consultants, although we have a Zambian national as part of our uh, team in London. Uh, you know, the, the idea is for us to work closely with Prospero to build the capacity, their capacity of Prospero and, 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 their, and their partner. And, uh, and to uh, try to limit maybe the use of external consultant or where there's a need for external consultant for um, organizations to be able to support financially with, uh, with that. Uh, I think 49 is probably, we've run through that and how Prospero could help in, a, in a, a broad range of way, but I think it could be useful for anyone who's attended this webinar to also provide feedback on how you think Prospero should be helping. Um, you know, and, and so there's a range of activities that we'll be implementing here, including this, this workshops, but also there will be a pre-incubator for project technical assistance for, for activities that, that have the potential to benefit from carbon finance that, you know, Prospero needs to engage as well and advocates to, to the public sector with strategy around this. And so there's a range of activities that, that we are, you know, starting to, to implement here. So that I think probably, uh, as Moses, you tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, all, all, all ideas are probably good ideas. And so I think feel free to share where you think uh, Prospero may be uh, uh, of most uh, value here. Um, and that's, that one last slide actually is about this really where we think we can, as Prospero sort of support the, 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 the various part of the pro segment of the process that, that, uh, that we've run through today, you know, supporting projects or and activities and SMEs that go through the carbon project certification process, you know, uh, from sort of eligibility studies to all the way up to sort of monitoring the impact of programs. And these include a range of, of, of uh, you know, a task uh, feasibility studies, business and financial plans, concept note, uh, selecting the appropriate uh, carbon quantification methodology, drafting the product documents that will be used to certify the project, liaising with auditors. Um, and 
you know, keeping track of, of the development of the carbon markets. Um, it is expected to boom, really. We believe we're at the beginning of a new sort of golden age for the carbon markets. And so things will change uh, quite significantly over time in the coming sort of five to 10 years. And so I think Prospera is also in a good position to be able to uh, you know, keep aware and, and, and of all these changes and, um, and, and sort of share knowledge and, and, and on the evolution of the carbon market. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously Prospero being, you know, well embedded into the, the Zambian economy and, and sort of being able to, um, you know, make the link between SMEs and, and, uh, and the public sector, um, you know, is, is something that we see as, as a strong added value that Prosperity could, could, could bring to the, to the table when it comes to supporting SMEs to uh, benefit from carbon finance. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Oliver, for that. Uh, I hope it's uh, quite clear now. I think maybe just for the process of time, I think we're just going to go into the chat and uh, maybe if we could just try to respond to uh, four questions from there then the questions I think we can email or then we can simply get in touch uh, with us so that we can directly uh, interact and uh, discuss various various issues. So Yvonne, can you just read, read out for us uh, four questions from this chat? Uh, All right. Moses, before um, Yvonne, before Moses, uh, Moses, before Yvonne reads, I thought you said I should be the next to speak after <laughs> Olivia. Oh, sorry about that. I thought your hand is down, so I thought that maybe. Oh, your, <laughs> I put it down because you said you are going to speak. <laughs> okay, uh, just a quick one. All right, so thank you very much again. Go yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, just a couple of questions, uh, a couple of comments and a question. One is just the, the roadmap for having uh, to start trading. Uh, if I noticed from the previous presentation, it was about 33 weeks or so, which is close to three years just to prepare before someone uh, uh, starts to trade. I thought that's a kind of a, a long time. Then secondly, there is also need for us as Zambians to engage the private sector in Zambia. Uh, to be to buy uh, these carbon credits uh, rather than spend uh, rather than relying on our colleagues in the West, uh, because at the moment it's the local companies also that are damaging the, the economy, uh, sorry the the landscape or forestry landscape, and they will be able to appreciate this rather than our colleagues from uh, from outside. And uh, another comment is that uh, I think the Prospero business model of building capacity is well recommended uh, in this area. Uh, that's what has been lacking, like Olivia presented. I think we don't have the capacity for people to do uh, carbon credits. So to that, I would like to congratulate you. But also, as he just said in the last few comments, uh, wait, he said, look, this is going to be a big thing now. Uh, in the next five, 10 years, it's going to be a big, big thing. I agree with him. I've been looking at this carbon credit since 2012 and to the last few years when I stopped looking at it. But I'm glad that now there's an appetite for carbon credit. And uh, there's probably, as it grows, there's probably a need for the government to set up a, car a carbon credit market regulator. I'm not sure whether Luce or the Stock Exchange uh, Commission would be able to do that but I, I see that as the industry grows or the business grows there will be need for a regulator to uh, maintain a, a level of playing field um i think also just last uh, for those that will be interested i will encourage that prospero uh, creates what we call a community of practitioners uh, on this we are not yet practitioners but i think try to create something like that where people can network and build capacity among us themselves. I thank you. Um, 
Okay, yeah, I think it was more so Jack, for those comments. It. They are all taken. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Moses. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Yvonne, just go to the chat so that you can just read out uh, four questions. Then uh, Olivia will respond. Then after that, uh, we'll close the meeting. Thank you. All right. Um, the first one is uh, alluding to the presentation that was made. Abraham is asking, why did carbon prices drop from 30 to 40 uh, US dollars per carbon emission to below 10 uh, US dollars per carbon emission on the Chicago Carbon Exchange from 2008? That's a, that's a very specific question. I think, I think we should all be aware that the carbon Chicago Climate Exchange uh, is something that took place 20 years ago. Um, and that was actually uh, it's interesting, obviously, because that was the first ever, um, I think, uh, times that carbon credits were traded on an exchange. Uh, but it mostly dropped because of the lack of, of buyer at the time. There was very little, um, there's very little traction. There was very little reason why, you know, 20 years ago, I think no one was really talking about climate change. Companies did not really have any plans to do anything about climate change. The general public wasn't really uh, getting it. And so when the Chicago Climate Exchange started, you know, trying to allocate carbon credits to farmers, uh, changing their agricultural practices, uh, I think there was at the beginning a bit of a bubble and everyone got interested and found that fascinating. But then it it can drop because of the lack of uh, of buyers really on on that market, and then after a few years, they've simply dropped the, the entire scheme. So it was, uh, I think that just a painful learning, uh, being sometimes the first one. You know, you either either take it all or lose it all. All right, um, and then. All right, this one says, is it only NGOs that are eligible for this carbon project or even profit-making companies with vision to reduce emission can be considered? Um, everyone really, it's because it's well, not only because, but it's a voluntary carbon market and there is uh, no governing entity at the moment. But even even when it, you know, even though the Kyoto Protocol or the Paris Agreement where it's a bit more regulated, um, anyone can really benefit from, from that mechanism. Uh, otherwise, we would not be having this, 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 you know, conversation because I think that, you know, Prospero really wants to support the SMEs of Zambia. Uh, and so, um, obviously, the nature of the activity sometimes um, means that uh, NGOs are, uh, you know, in a good position to implement activities at a large scale. But that's the only reason, you know, maybe if sometimes, you know, NGOs are a bit more active in that space, um, if so. Um, so, yeah, anyone can really benefit from, from, from that mechanism. There's not, no barriers in terms of the nature of the business uh, that, you, that you run. But you need to be able to demonstrate if you're, uh, you know, a for-profit organization, you need to be able to demonstrate that you're uh, facing some kind of challenges to deploy your product activities or services uh, and that you need, um, you know, uh, uh, there's uh, selling carbon credits to overcome these barriers. All right. Uh, this one says, can the livestock sector participate in carbon markets? So again, sorry? The livestock sector, can they participate or can oh, yeah. they? Yeah, I think it's not been, um, I think I need to, to look at how uh, this is dealt with in the, in the Zambian climate change uh, uh, um, uh, a plan and strategy. I don't have that on top of my head, but yes, uh, livestock is often a large or significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, you know, so things related to, for instance, you know, the use of animal waste for generating energy or the change of animal feeds for livestock could, could be the sort of things that could trigger emission reductions. The challenge with this, I think, is that they would they would come at a fairly high. Uh, these are activities that would that would come at a fairly high cost, you know, per ton of carbon dioxide of bodies are reduced, and so for that reason, I think this is a sector that is not massively being benefiting from 
uh, from carbon finance. Another way possibly to look at that is, is how uh, livestock may be using rangelands and degrading rangelands uh, through, through uh, pastoral activities. Uh, and, and how changing that might be sort of restoring the soil and the carbon in, in the soil. So that does, yeah, that's the sort of activities that, you know, could take place in, the, in, in that sector. All right. Um, uh, maybe two common ones are around certification processes and which entities exactly in Zambia are certifying. Right. So at the moment, the certification standards are international. Are you able to and so, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, okay. uh, yeah. So I was saying the international well certification standards are international, and so there's no um, Zambian organizations, but actually across up Saharan Africa, I'm not aware. Maybe in South Africa, there's one organization that sort of certify a project that that is not very well known, but. Uh, so there's no one organization dedicated to, to, to Zambia, and maybe that's something that, that we could, you know, change. Uh, you know, that, that, that could be a good idea to have. But at the moment, those are international certification standards. So uh, similar rules are applied across the developing countries, I'd say, and many sectors, um, you know, from organizations that, are, that operate internationally. All right. Thank you. Uh, another one is about how businesses can partner with Prospero. How can business? How can businesses partner with Prospero in carbon markets? Right, good question. Moses, would you like to, unless Brian is here, but uh, do you want to tackle this one? Or uh, maybe I can, I can, I can step in just to mention this is the 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 moment that which uh, Prospero is uh, setting up. It's a uh, carbon units. So I think the different points within the value chain on which Prospero can come in will so much depend uh, on the needs of the market. So we can do, uh, for instance, maybe project development, uh, helping them with, for instance, in calculation of uh, emission reductions, as well as uh, linking them, for instance, maybe to uh, different uh, carbon markets. So it depends with uh, the stage of uh, the business and where the latest impact would be made with that uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that. I think that's that's all from the chat. So I can, I can see Jack's hand is up, so I don't know whether he's got a question, so maybe he can be the last person if he has, if he has a question, then oh, we can sure close. Moses. Yeah, first I would like to commend for Prospero for stepping in, uh, closing. I think it's the right move you have made and uh, we're in with you. So uh, I think we should benefit a lot from this kind of an uh, uh, adventure as a people. Uh, the, my, my question is, are you going to share with us the, uh, uh, the presentation? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jack. So the presentation and uh, the coding will be shared with everyone. Then also just to mention that uh, for the sake of time and uh, uh, to be shared with everyone, I think. Uh, Questions. What we're going to do is that we're going to copy all the questions from the chat, provide responses, and uh, circulate with everyone. Uh, there are no more questions. We would like to close the meeting. And uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for finding time to participate. This is just the beginning. I'm sure there will be more meetings which will be coming through so that we can keep uh, interacting and uh, sharing ideas and finding ways in which we could uh, collaborate and deliver benefits to uh, the communities. Thank you very much, Olivia. And thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for joining.